Good day, and um, here we are one more time. Lord willing, uh, we will have a blessed time together. It's been a very wonderful day for myself uh, here at the church. We had a wedding earlier this day, and um, a young couple uh, were married, and uh, those times can be pretty exciting for families and friends as well as emotional so that was a blessed uh, opportunity for myself to uh, officiate at that marriage and uh, pray over it as well. But here we are. We are coming back to our sermon series, uh, A Living Hope, uh, verse-by-verse study of First Peter. I hope you've had an opportunity to uh, read First Peter a few times, at least since the beginning and uh, of our, st- our time together. And and I would encourage you to continue to do so, uh, to read through First Peter, and you might as well continue on to Second Peter, because I, I believe that's where we'll be going after we're done with First Peter. Anyways, thank you for having me in your places, and uh, I pray, as I said earlier, that you will be blessed today by uh, this message from the Word of God. It was just past week, uh, which was a rather busy week for myself. I... I still had time to, uh, at least I hope, prepare properly for this message. And in that preparation, I came across an article from Christianity Today uh, that was dated September 2022. And the article uh, reporting uh, was reporting on the findings of the State of Theology survey released by Le- uh, Ligonier Ministries and LifeWay Research. And the article began with a rather interesting and, I think, revealing statement. Um, Quote, American evangelicals' grasp on theology is slipping, and more than than half affirmed heretical views of God. For example, the survey revealed in 2022 that 73% of evangelicals agreed with the statement that, quote, Jesus is the first and greatest being created. In other words, 73% of evangelicals, which is a fair percentage, were in agreement, in agreement with one of the earliest forms of heresy that had a large impact on the early church, Arianism. This popular heresy of the early church was promoted by a fellow by the name of Arius, which, who denied the deity of Jesus Christ. This was denounced by the Council of Nicaea in 325, There, the council affirming what the Bible teaches, that Jesus was not made, but eternally begotten and one in being with the Father. We find a number of scriptures attesting to this. For example, John 3.16 and John 14.9 through to 11. Now, if you're wondering where I'm going with this, wonder no more. Because, friends, surveys such as the state of theology underscore the importance of knowing what the Bible teaches concerning doctrines, such as the person and work of Jesus Christ. Friends, it's my presupposition that biblical literacy is a major factor leading to stats, such as released in 2022 from Ligonier Ministries and LifeWay Research, concerning the state of theology in the evangelical church. So it should be no surprise to us that uh, if 73% of, 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 pardon me, of evangelicals believe, quote, Jesus is a creative being, then the survey, which revealed then 43% of evangelicals affirmed that Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. And if Jesus is a created being and only a good teacher, then it would be no stretch to see that 56% of evangelicals affirm that God, quote, God accepts the worship of all religions. Again, my presupposition is simply this, that more and more evangelicals today are biblically illiterate. They simply do not know the Bible at all. So with this in mind, uh, I wonder, or we should wonder, what biblically illiterate evangelicals would do with other doctrinal issues that arise from the Bible, from the Word of God. For example, hell, sin, those kinds of things. How about this one? God's revelation throughout the Old Testament that anticipates and announces the redemption that God would accomplish in and through the person and work of Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. 
You know, a passing study in the New Testament finds that the apostles themselves in the New Testament, when they read the Old Testament, they saw references to Jesus Christ and the kingdom that he proclaimed that we find in the four Gospels. And what? Such apostle who's, who did this was Peter, and we find this in the text that we will be studying together today. So please turn your Bibles to chapter, uh, to 1 Peter chapter 1, pardon me, and uh, we'll be reading uh, from chapter, uh, verse 1 through to 12. Chapter uh, 1, verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. May Greece and... May Greece... <laughs> sorry, guys. There we go. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who, by God's power, are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Verse 6, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found a result in praise and glory and honor, at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him, do not now see him. Um, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning his salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. Verse 12, it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray together. Lord God, we thank you. Uh, now as we spend some time together, Looking at uh, chapter 1 here of 1 Peter, specifically verse 10 to uh, 12, 10, 11, and 12. And we, we just thank you for this opportunity, Lord. And we ask that your spirit would not only inform us, but enlighten us and give us also the, um, the feet and the hands to do the work that you've asked us to do for the furtherance of your kingdom, for the spreading of your gospel, for the glory of God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I just uh, want to remind you that, as I briefly alluded to earlier, just at the beginning, I mean, uh, of our time, that we have been going through First Peter now for a while. We began this sermon series about a month ago. So there's a number of uh, verses here that we've already dealt with, specifically verse 1 through to 9. And if you're just here for the first time, I would uh, highly encourage you to not only read First Peter, uh, but also maybe check out the three other sermons that were preached through verse 1 to 9. You'll find that on redwateralliance.org at our website. Uh, you can check sermons there or on YouTube page, uh, Redwater Alliance as well. I think you can catch it on Facebook as well. But I digress. So as I mentioned, our focus will be primarily with verse 10, 11, and 12. Here the Apostle Peter said in verse 10, concerning this salvation. Here we have the preposition translated concerning, pointing the Apostle's audience to the subject at hand. What is the subject? It's this salvation. Concerning this salvation. So keeping with the number one rule of sound biblical exegesis, or we could say Bible study, uh, we go context, 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 it behooves us to quickly survey what has been said or had been said so far about salvation up to this point. And we look at verse 3 to 9 here in chapter 1, we can summarize the Apostle Peter's comments on salvation in this way. Hopefully it's helpful for you. First, salvation is received by faith alone. 
these elect exiles that Paul, uh, Peter was writing to. I'm going to do this again. Peter, Paul, all over the place there. Peter was writing to, uh, had received a salvation, as the apostle put it here at verse 5, through faith for our salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In other words, when Jesus returned. We go to the author of the letter of Hebrews, who said this, um, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now Hebrews chapter 11, all of it, provides us with one faithful servant of God after another who were, according to the writer of Hebrews, commended for pleasing God in and through their lives. So the question, how did these faithful ones in Hebrews chapter 11 please God? Well, let's let the author of the letter respond. He said, and without faith is impossible to please them, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Secondly, we had discussed in, in uh, I think, the last message, the mercy of God. And we find here in Peter's letter that the mercy of God is revealed when one is born again. Born again, what Peter would say through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, verse 3. You know, when we look at the Bible as a whole, the whole content of the Bible speaks of a perfect, merciful, and just God. And our sin, the sin of the world, was paid in full by the death of Jesus Christ on a brutal Roman cross very, uh, some 2,000 years ago. And death and sin were dealt with once for all, as Paul, as, there we go again, Peter would put it this way, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, verse 3. So first, salvation is by faith alone. Secondly, because of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, salvation is made manifest from the inside out of a person. Peter would say they're born again. We could say it's a new spiritual birth. The Apostle Paul would put it in this way, a new creation. And thirdly, we see here in uh, the salvation that Peter is presenting to uh, his audience, the outcome of the faith, of their faith, your faith, my faith, is the salvation of your souls. Or as John the Apostle put it in his gospel, whoever believes in him, that is Christ, should not perish but have eternal life. John three sixteen. And it is this wonderful, biblical, theologically rich, redemptive plan of salvation that the Apostle Peter here is addressing or picks up here at verse 10, 11, and 12. Let's read a little more of verse 10. Peter said concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully. So let's begin by asking this question. Who were these prophets that had prophesied about the grace that the elect exiles had received? But one more step before we go further along, we are reminded that what was said at the onset, that the apostles, when they read the Old Testament, they saw re references to Jesus Christ and the kingdom he proclaimed. When we consider this, we understand that biblical theology helps us understand that God's redemptive purposes and plan are revealed throughout the Old Testament. In other words, friends, when we read and study the Old Testament, we will discover Christ in the pages of the Old Testament. Now, there's a word of caution here that we should be reminded of. When the apostles of the New Testament uh, did so, they did not apply any sort of magical formula in, in identifying Christ in the Old Testament. They come up with some uh, random scheme or some sort of set sort of scheme to, to identify Christ in the Old Testament. In fact, what they do provide for us in the New Testament is a pattern or a method in which we would be wise to follow. You see, friends, the Old Testament revelation anticipates and announces the work of Christ in a variety of ways. If you have been following uh, on our websites and, uh, and on our YouTube and Facebook, you might remember that this past May and into early June, our associate pastor, Pastor David, led us through a four-week sermon series that he called Whispers of the Messiah. 
Pastor David there appealing to the biblical texts such as Genesis and Deuteronomy and Exodus, pointing us to Christ in the Old Testament in the form of what is called in biblical theology types and shadows. These Old Testament uh, types and shadows, we are to be reminded, are not, Christ them, are not Christ himself, but they witness to him. They witness to Christ. And we find these types are primarily represented in the Old Testament in, in persons or places or things or events which prefigure the work of Christ or some facet of his kingdom. Now, we don't have time to go through all of those. Let's just start with the person, a person, and let's say Noah. So Noah, in the Old Testament, is a type of Christ. According to Moses in Genesis 6, chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 9, Noah, uh, Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. And because of Noah's righteousness, Noah prefigures the work of Christ. This righteous Noah, and remember, he's not perfect. He is a sinner. Uh, all are sinners, all born to sin. But nonetheless, this righteous Noah saves himself and his family, remember, from the waters of judgment that God brings onto the earth. And then he begins a new creation order. So as Noah served God's people, he serves us today as a type of Christ, who based, who based on Christ's Perfect righteousness will save all who take refuge in him. And we'll have to stop with that and we'll move on to the next place where we find throughout the Old Testament that Christ is present through God's promises of a coming Savior and Redeemer to deal with the curse of sin and the effect of sin in our world, the effect of sin in you and me. A world that we see clearly is rife with evil and brokenness and sadness and all those things. We go to Genesis chapter 3, there Moses recorded the fall of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve and their disobedience to God by eating the fruit of the forbidden tree of life sinned against God. And from this one act of disobedience against God, sin not only affected Adam and Eve, but all people born since. That includes you and me. The Apostle Paul put it in this way, this way in his letter to the church to Rome, is the letter to the church in Rome. Paul said, for we have already charged that all, that's a key phrase there, that all, both Jews and Greeks are under sin. Rome, Romans chapter 3, verse 9. Well, going back to that moment in the Garden of Eden, we encounter there the first place in the Old Testament of God's promise to send a Savior, to send a Redeemer. God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. It is called in biblical theology, the avenger. The, uh, I can't remember now. Forget it. <laughs> it's been a kind of a long day, but a wonderful day. A wedding's always wonderful. I digress. Back to Genesis 3, 15. Here we find, uh, really, an obvious promise of the Messiah to come. God, in effect, here pointing to the work that the Messiah will accomplish as the quote unquote messianic seed of the woman will overcome and triumph over the seed of the serpent. This promise of the gospel is repeated throughout the Old Testament. And we see this sort of summarized for us by the Apostle Paul in his second letter to Corinth, where Paul said, For all the promises of God, and he's pointing to all the promises of God in the Old Testament, find their yes in him, in Christ. That is why it is through him, that is Christ, that we utter our amen to God, our, our amen to God for his glory. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. So we have types and shadows, we have promise, and then we find Christ in the Old Testament through prophecy. Prophecy is announcing the coming of the Messiah. It's often described when you look in the Old Testament with this term called uh, uh, Savior of Israel, the promised Savior of Israel. Old Testament prophecy pointing to the kingdom God will install in and through his Son, Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. Trinity. 
Of course, time is not on our side, and it compels us to look at just one particular Old Testament prophet, and we're going to pick uh, one of the most uh, easy ones to understand, Isaiah, and specifically, we're going to look at chapter 7, verse 14. There Isaiah said, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, if you're familiar with uh, the Christmas story, you might understand what this word Emmanuel means. Well, it means God with us. This was Isaiah's prophecy that announced the presence of God with his people. And we can pick up the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy approximately 700 years later in Matthew's gospel at the arrival of the incarnate son of God, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, or Jesus the Messiah. There in the first chapter of Matthew's gospel, we find the uh, encounter between an angel and Joseph, who said to Joseph, Take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you, sh and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people for, from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken through the prophet. And now he quotes Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Matthew chapter 1, verse 20 to 23. So friends, we have types and shadows. We have promise and prophecy foreshadowing Christ in the Old Testament. Well, let's go back to the question we asked of uh, verse 10. Who were these prophets that had prophesied about the grace the elect exiles had received? Well, again, the answer is a little uh, larger than we can do today. The answer to this question requires you and me to open up our Bibles, beginning with Genesis and working our way through the Old Testament until we finish and conclude with Malachi. And quickly, we can say in the Pentateuch, the first part of the Bible, the five, uh, five books, the first five books of the Bible, we find Moses, who was a prophet. We go to the histories uh, in the Old Testament, and there we find King David, who was a prophet. Then we go to the prophets themselves, as we already alluded to or talked about Isaiah, who was a prophet. And if you did a, just a careful reading of Moses and David and, I, and Isaiah, you would discover prophecy concerning Christ. And the Apostle Peter here in the text, now appealing not only to Moses, David, and Isaiah, but to the prophets of the Old Testament who prophesied about the grace that was to be, that was to be yours. Verse 10. Well, moving along, we asked what was prophesied by the prophets. Remember that question? The Apostle Peter answers this for us. The prophets, according to Peter, searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories, verse 10 and 11. Don't get hung up on this term, Spirit of Christ. It's just another way of saying, another way of saying Holy Spirit. But there's a few things we do want to point out here. First, the Old Testament prophets searched and inquired carefully. Here we see this at verse 10. Consider with me then what the Apostle Peter said in his second letter concerning prophecy in relation to what he called in that letter the prophetic writing or the prophetic word, that is the word of God, the Holy Bible. Peter said in that letter, his second letter, no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. So here's the point, folks. Old Testament prophets and New Testament prophets, like the Apostle Peter, did not speak outside of what God had revealed in his word, in his scripture. Canadian pastor Tim Chalice said of many who call themselves prophets today in the church this, quote, the prophet claims to be gifted by God to speak fresh revelation outside of scripture. New authoritative words of prediction and teaching and rebuke or encouragement. Pastor Tim goes on to say this also, quote, in reality, though, he is commissioned and empowered by Satan for the purpose of misleading and disrupting Christ's church, end quote. 
I think we would be very wise to heed Pastor Tim's word, words here and remember, more importantly, what John the Apostle said in his first letter concerning false prophets. John said, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Again, to repeat my point, the Old Testament prophets, the New Testament prophets, like the Apostle Peter, like the Apostle Paul, like the Apostle John, did not add or speak outside the revelation of God in his holy world. Word. They did not believe every spirit, but they searched and inquired carefully, as Peter said here in our text. As they were led, these prophets were led by the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, same, same, same thing here, that was indicating that God had predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories to come. Verse 10 and 11. Here the apostle appealing to the revelation of God's redemptive plan that was revealed to the Old Testament prophets. As he said here in verse 12, it was revealed to them, that is the Old Testament prophets, that they were serving not themselves, but you, speaking to his audience in the letter, and the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Verse 12, people like the apostle Peter and Paul and others who preach the good news by the power of the Holy Spirit that was sent from heaven on Pentecost. And then he adds at the end just something very interesting, things into which the angels long to look. We don't have time to take a deep dive into that. But it's a very interesting statement nonetheless. Well, this brings us to the end of verse 12. I guess it remains to ask, why did the Apostle Peter say the things he said here in this text? Maybe we've already answered those, but let's answer that again. The answer then is found within the reason the apostle wrote his letter. Remember when we began the study, we understood that the apostle Peter was addressing Christians who were grieved by various trials. We see this in verse 6 of chapter 1. And these trials and different kinds of persecution were found in a variety of places. Could have come from family or friends. It even happens today in our time from workplaces and spaces, from public markets, sometimes from local governments back in those days, and sometimes even from the Roman authorities. And eventually we know in church history that even the Roman government would have a widespread persecution of Christians. And Peter here wrote a letter to encourage his tormented readers. In these three verses that we just briefly examined, the apostle had encouraged his readers by highlighting the, just the splendor, the wonder, and the fullness and majesty of their salvation that was revealed through the Old Testament prophets and many other ways we already talked about. The very fullness of their salvation, the very reason for their affliction in the first place. My friends, the apostle Peter here writing a very wonderful pastoral letter to encourage his troubled audience and remind them of the good news of the gospel that they had received and accepted was not only for that day, but was also for their tomorrows and beyond. And the same for us, you and me today. My friends, that in God's sovereign purpose and plan, revealed through his prophets, would one day be fully realized. That the outcome of their faith, your faith and my faith as well, would be the salvation of their souls. Or as John put it, eternal life. Well, friends, that kind of wraps things up for us. I, I, I want to conclude by reading a portion from the Apostle Paul's first letter to Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. This is a wonderful piece of scripture, and I commend it to you, and I hope it brings you encouragement in your trials and tribulations and struggles in life today. Paul said, Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the gospel I preach to you, which you received and which you stand, by which you are being saved. If you, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. The Lord bless his word. Let us pray. Father, I thank you.
Oh, I thank you for the good news of your son, Jesus Christ, who took a wretch like me and saved my bacon. Oh, Lord, thank you. That's, a, that's all I can say. And I thank you for my friends who are watching or listening to this. I pray, God, that if they have not surrendered their life to you, Lord Jesus, that they would consider that in their lives. Would you bring them into repentance, Lord, and into salvation? Thank you, Lord, for this message. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. God bless. Shalom.